Crowds and Party by Jody Dean Verso, 2016 Chapter 5 The Passional Dynamics of the Communist Party It sometimes seems as if people on the left love revolution, but hate the party. We enthusiastically support transformation, especially personal transformation. Yet in the same breath we scoff at institutionalized practices strategically oriented toward the pursuit of radical political change. Many of us thus reject the organizational form that marks the difference between the chaos of revolution and the building of a new political and social order. With this rejection, we shield ourselves from a confrontation with the real of division, luxuriating instead in the fantasy of the beautiful moment. The party is a political form that compels this confrontation. It claims, occupies, and mobilizes it. This chapter continues the investigation of the psychodynamics of the party introduced in Chapter 4. Using examples from British and US American communism, I highlight the symbolic space of the party. What enabled the Communist Party to provide a location from which communists in the UK and US could see their actions as valuable and worthwhile? My claim is that the effective infrastructure of the party provided the material support for its symbolic location. Ceaseless practice generated the intensities that members directed onto themselves, letting them push themselves such that they could see themselves as changing the world. They became bigger, able to do more than they could have imagined, and the world became present in the everyday. So instead of considering the Communist Party in terms of ideology, program, leadership, or organizational structure, I approach it in terms of the dynamics of feeling it generates and mobilizes. More than an instrument for political power, the Communist Party provides an effective infrastructure that enlarges the world. The Communist Party's capacity to enlarge the world comes at a cost. The knot of unconscious processes that holds open the space for communist political subjectivity exerts constant, even unrealizable, demands. Bluntly put, seeing yourself as changing the world requires you to look at yourself from a position that makes relentless demands on you, a position that compels and judges and accepts no excuses. If that's what communists want, and we should, then we have to confront these costs head on. The stronger the political organization we build, the greater will be its, and our, expectations. Organizing us, the party compels us, or, differently put, it is the apparatus through which we compel ourselves to do what we must, to do what has to be done because we cannot, will not, acquiesce to inequality, exploitation, and oppression. Sometimes you have to cook a few eggs. I begin with a story from Vivian Gornick's The Romance of American Communism. It's about an organizer named Eric Lanzetti and a young party member named Lily. I like this story because it illustrates the themes of enlargement and courage that the party perspective provides. Lanzetti grew up in a West Virginia mining town after fascism pushed his father out of Italy. He attended Brown and Oxford on scholarship. In 1938, having been radicalized by the war in Spain, Lanzetti joined the Communist Party. Within a short time, he was made a section organizer on the Lower East Side of New York City. In one of the interviews with American communists at the basis of Gornick's book, Lanzetti tries to convey the reach of the party on New York's Lower East Side in the 30s, its moral place in the life of the neighborhood. He gives the example of Lily. Quotation from Lanzetti She wasn't the smartest person in the world, but she was a hard-working, conscientious communist, with a powerful sense of class. She lived alone with her father on Rivington Street. The old man was an Orthodox Jew who paid absolutely no attention to her or to her politics or anything. She made his breakfast in the morning, went to work, came home, made his dinner, went to a meeting, came home, made him hot milk, and that was it. The old man sat reading the Talmud all day long. Lily ran the house entirely. If it wasn't for her working, they would have both starved. But he was her father and she was scared shitless of him. End of quotation from Lanzetti One evening after a meeting, Lanzetti recalls, Lily wanted to talk to him about something. Hesitantly, she started to tell him about a man with whom she was in love. Lanzetti assumed Lily wanted to know whether she should sleep with him, so he started to talk about how sex outside of marriage is not a problem. 
Oh no, 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 she interrupts me, it's nothing like that. Of course, we've been sleeping together. It's that he's Chinese. I'm terrified to tell my father we want to get married. Lanzetti recounts that he stared at her, momentarily dumbfounded. Then he replied, look, if you're afraid to tell him alone I'll go with you. You'll go with me? She says. Not only me, I say, we'll take a delegation if that'll make you feel any better. A delegation? She says. Sure, I say, getting into the swing of it, we'll take the whole damn communist party. A month later, Lily approached Lanzetti again. He asked her what had happened. She says that it took a while for her to get up the nerve, but then she finally told her father she was getting married. Her father asked, is he Jewish? No, she answered. He's Chinese. Lily's father was silent for a long time. I'll kill you, he finally said. Lily relates that her knees started to buckle. Quotation from Lanzetti Then all of a sudden it was like you were in there in the room with me. I saw you and my branch organizer and all the people I work with and I felt like the whole Communist Party was right there in the room with me. I looked at my father and I said to him, if you kill me, who'll cook your eggs? End of quotation from Lanzetti Lanzetti tells a story of expansion, of becoming many. He describes how he imparted to Lily the sense that she wasn't alone. There was a crowd standing with her. She was backed by the party. She could gather confidence from the fact that countless others, the whole damned communist party, would be right there with her when she confronted her father. And, according to Lanzetti, Lily felt this, she saw them. Her sense of having the solidarity of the specific people she knew expands into a sense of the whole of the party standing there with her, supporting her. As she sees the party right there with her, she becomes stronger, more courageous. A cramped apartment layered in fear transforms into a site of triumph, collective power saturating the everyday and the courage of the cheeky retort, who'll cook your eggs. Lanzetti sees Lily as a class-conscious communist, someone who works hard who is at the edge of survival but nonetheless attends meeting after meeting after working both to earn a wage and care for her father. He observes the repetitions of her daily life, how she prepares meal after meal for the silent father she fears. As Lanzetti narrates the story, he stumbles. He mistakenly presumes that, for Lily, he is a supposed to know a kind of truth about sex, the conditions of its permissibility. Lanzetti slips into imagining himself as one who might validate a young working-class Jewish woman's sexual independence. She wasn't the smartest person in the world, after all. But Lily doesn't position him as knowing something about sex. She doesn't need this validation. Of course she was sleeping with the man she loved. The problem wasn't sex. It was her father as he held the place of family, religion, and race. Lily was terrified by the prospect of a confrontation with her father by the challenge of open rejection of his law. Lanzetti recognizes his error. He didn't know. He guessed wrong about what she wanted and in the moment of his guess he confined Lily to a traditionally gendered expectation beyond which she had already moved. After all, she was a class-conscious communist. Correcting himself, Lanzetti turns to the party for its solidarity, no longer imagining himself as the one who might authorize Lily but looking at both of them from the perspective of the party. He gets into the swing of things, feeling the power that accrues as one becomes more and then many, himself, delegation, the whole damned party. Lanzetti's story is about more than Lily. It's about himself as an organizer and how he transmitted the sense of the party to Lily so that she was emboldened openly to reject her father, and not just covertly to transgress the law he embodied. Class consciousness, which Lily already has, isn't the same as the political confidence or practical optimism that the party inspires. The life of a neighborhood, as well as the workplace experience, may generate a shared sensibility or even identity. That sensibility nourishes political potential. But it is not sufficient for a politics. It is not yet explicit as a division or a will. To be a communist is to go to meeting after meeting, to work hard, maybe even to remain poor, but it is also to have access to a force strong enough to go up against the law and win a force neither fully internal nor external, neither reducible to particular organizational features nor separate from them, but rather an effective infrastructure capable of enlarging the world. The Enduring Crowd
Elias Canetti's study of the crowd is a theory of collective desire. The crowd assembles libidinal and affective intensities into the force of a longing irreducible to the crowd's emotion, to the specific excitement or event that calls it together. Canetti classifies crowds with respect to their prevailing emotion, the baiting crowd out for the kill, the flight crowd in which everyone flees, the prohibition crowd that refuses, the reversal crowd turning against those who command or oppress it, and the feast crowd that enjoys in common. What we might think of as the unconscious structure and processes of the crowd, the crowd's economy of enjoyment, persists through or underneath these different types of crowds. As I discussed in Chapter 3, this crowd unconscious has four attributes, a desire to grow, a state of absolute equality, which Canetti defines as the discharge, a love of density, and a need of direction. These crowd attributes dynamically generate collective jouissance. The desire to increase, expand, accumulate, and extend infuses even the crowd enclosed in an institution. The urge to grow is ineliminable, a primary impulse of the crowd. Crowds can be open or closed, but even spatial limitations can be breached by the crowd's desire to grow. Consider, for example, the odd obviousness of majority rule. The weight of number forces itself as the push of the crowd. It exerts as pressure, no matter whether right or wrong, reasonable or not. Even those who object and resist encounter this pressure. Going against the crowd is hard. The crowd wants to pull everything into itself, to take on more and increase itself. Canetti writes, the crowd never feels itself saturated. With the discharge, Canetti offers a view of equality fundamentally different from the psychoanalytic association of equality with envy. Equality in the crowd is de differentiation, de individuation, the momentary release from hierarchy, closure, and separation. It is for the sake of this equality that people become a crowd and that they tend to overlook anything which might detract from it, Canetti writes. All demands for justice and all theories of equality ultimately derive their energy from the actual experience of equality familiar to anyone who has been part of a crowd. The press for equality comes not from resentment. It's not born of weakness or deprivation. It comes from the strength of many as it amplifies itself, reinforces itself, and pushes itself back upon itself. With shouts, exclamations, and noise, the spontaneous utterance in common the crowd expresses the equality that is its substance. The crowd's density is its indivisibility or degree of solidarity. Understood physiologically, density manifests itself in commonality of feeling, for example, the excitement that passes through the crowd, amplifying and feeding into itself. Close proximity helps here. Conetti pairs equality and density, telling us that in the dancing crowd they coincide. The skillful enactment of density and equality engenders the crowd feeling. The crowd's direction is its goal. When common, the goal strengthens the feeling of equality. The stronger the common goal is, the weaker the individual goals that threaten the crowd's density. Whereas Le Bon and Freud attribute the crowd's need for direction to its need for a leader, Canetti makes direction into a process internal to the crowd, direction, common cause, subordinates individual preferences. Everyone belonging to a crowd carries within him a small traitor who wants to eat, drink, make love and be left alone. When the crowd has a direction, when it is moving toward a goal, it can remain dense. Without its goal, the crowd disintegrates into individuals pursuing their own private ends. The goal is outside the crowd, that toward which it is oriented. The goal is not the discharge, although the discharge is the aim. Canetti's crowd processes resemble psychoanalytic dynamics of desire and drive. Growth and direction point outwards. Equality and density turn back in. Together they form the knot of intensities I am referring to as the crowd unconscious. The crowd isn't structured like a language. It isn't a discursive formation. Rather, it's the dynamic press of many, the force exerted by collectivity. It doesn't have a politics any more than does an anthill, forest, or heap of stones. Canetti's crowds include dancing warriors and swarms of insects, spermatozoa and the dead, production and inflation. The real press of many takes and disrupts multiple forms, material, institutional, imaginary, symbolic. It also occurs in varying temporalities, quick or slow, momentary or enduring. The multiplicity of forms and tempos overlap and intersect, flowing together into a crowd of crowds. What the crowd wants most of all, what it lacks, is endurance. Canetti writes, the tendency of all human crowds to become more and more, the blind, 
reckless, dynamic movement which sacrifices everything to itself and which is always present in a gathering crowd, this tendency is transferable. He doesn't explicate the concept. Instead he gives multiple examples, hunters transfer the growth tendency to their prey, farmers transfer it to their crops, modern Europeans transfer it to money, using the word million as the basic unit for counting population and money, the abstract number has become filled with a crowd meaning contained by no other number today. The mechanisms of transference matter little to Canetti. He blurs together rituals, symbols, and processes. All enable the transmission or displacement of the crowd's desire to increase from the crowd onto something else. Wheat, mountains, and sea can become crowd symbols because they can carry the desire for increase. Practical Optimism Although Canetti doesn't make this point, the party, too, can carry the desire for increase as well as other attributes of the crowd unconscious. As it gathers and generates power, the party, especially the Communist Party, operates as a transferential object, a symbol and combination of rituals and processes, for the collective action of the many. The crowd wants to endure. The party provides an apparatus for this endurance. Marxist discussions of the party typically focus on the organizational and ideological aspects of the party apparatus, vanguard versus mass, covered versus legal, revolutionary versus reformist. Left out is the effective infrastructure of the party, its reconfiguration of the crowd unconsciousness into a political form. Gavin Walker shifts discussion toward this reconfiguration. He describes the party as a material substratum that allows the reverberations or overtone of the event to remain at the core of a consistency. As the body that turns the subjectivizing crowd event into a moment in a subjective process of politicizing the people, the party is tasked with transmitting the event's overtone. It can't simply declare an event to be an action of the heroic working class or revolutionary people. The party has to defend this declaration in a hostile setting. Even more, it has to ensure its truth, conducing the effective intensity of the crowd discharge in the wake of its dissipation. Under contemporary conditions of communicative capitalism, non-stop ubiquitous media offer a never-ending supply of disasters, invasions, shootings, and protests. Scandals and epidemics displace one another as the most important issue of the day, their measure in tweets testimony to their inability to produce a gap in the dominant order. Anyone can issue an interpretation of an event, calling it this or that and attempting to push discussions in one direction rather than another. Moreover, a certain reflexivity, a self-consciousness about media, is a constitutive feature of communicative capitalism. Hashtags, slogans, memes, images, and phrases or manners of speech that briefly achieve a kind of recognizable currency before becoming outmoded or forgotten all point to the multiple, distributed ways in which communicative acts are less about meaning than circulation, less about use value than exchange value. This setting poses particular problems for left politics, how can acts remain intelligible as acts of a collective subject? How do the people prevent their acts from being absorbed back into communicative capitalism? The party provides an effective infrastructure that can help address these problems. Rather than ceding the transmission of the overtone to intellectuals, particularly those individualized within academic or journalistic career paths, and instead of requiring fragmented activists working along multiple separate trajectories to produce their alliance event by event, issue by issue, the party is a form for concentration and endurance. In a capitalist setting, the party provides communism with the body, one that is heterogeneous, porous, and polymorphous. By the end of the 20th century, this body was present primarily as memory, fear, bureaucracy, or sect, as former necessity and current impossibility. The perspective it provides became so many scattered inclinations to political correctness, no less righteous and insistent for all their fragmentation into weakness. Indeed. The superegoic effects of righteous injunction seem all the more intense precisely because there is no party that can anchor them, no program to which one might appeal for justification and relief. Circulating as insults and directives in social media, these effects rage as an incessant urge to police and punish, whipping the left into the frenzy of its own failure. The left can see differences, but no longer pull them together into a politics. Concentration and endurance are not the same as agreement. Communist parties, like the left more broadly, are always sites of debate, argument, factions, and splintering. 
putting Lacanese, to think of the party in terms of either agreement or schism is to remain at the level of the imaginary where the party is nothing but a figure of egoism and competition. But the symbolic dimension of the party, its form as a place from which communists assess themselves and their actions, is what matters. Concentration and endurance adhere to the party form at the level of the symbolic. The everyday experiences of rank and final members of CPUSA and CPGB testify to the symbolic effect of the Communist Party. I use examples from these parties because of their weakness. The US and UK were neither party states nor parliamentary systems where communists have ever had much electoral success. Even in the 1930s and 40s when the Communist Party was at its strongest in the US and UK, actual political power was out of reach. In the 20th century, neither country appeared on the brink of proletarian revolution. Instead each encountered a mix of de-radicalizing middle-class prosperity, working-class defeat, and capitalist aggression, not to mention the intense anti-communism of the Cold War. How, then, under conditions even Moscow agreed were far from revolutionarily ripe, did a communist sensibility endure? What enabled the Communist Party to provide a location from which members in the US and UK could see their actions as necessary and important and that even non-members could and would adopt? My claim, as I mentioned at the outset of this chapter, is that the effective infrastructure of the party provided the material support for its symbolic location. Lauren Berl and Presence Effect Theory is another phase in the history of ideology theory. Common and atmospheric, effect intertwines knowing and doing infusing each with a feeling mood sensibility irreducible to individual emotional dispositions. Attention to effect can open up a register beyond texts and practices, providing access to a domain of attachments and expectations productive of a mode of life. Berlant observes that the Marxist tradition has offered multiple ways to engage the effective aspects of class antagonism, labor practices, a communally generated feeling that emerges from inhabiting a zone of lived structure. Whether as histories of the working class, analyses of the structure of feelings specific to an historical formation, or readings of a world in terms of its aesthetics, Marxist cultural theory has usefully documented and explored the conditions of class belonging. It generally neglects party belonging. Where class appears in the rich fabric of work and life, in the culture and customs ostensibly inspiring the collective identity mobilized in the party, the party appears as mechanistic and cold. Against the abundance of everyday diversity, the party seems abstract, calculating, instrumental. I want to change this perception of the party. Berlant herself looks to effect to discern the specificity of the mediation of desire in late neoliberalism. She is concerned with the attrition of a fantasy, a collectively invested form of life, the good life. In contrast to Berlant's cruel optimism, I attend to the practical optimism generated through the party. I consider the building up of hope through the transmission of a communist sensibility in settings characterized by its absence. Rather than tracing diminution and loss, I track intensification and gain, the production of new conviction, as we see with Lily and Lanzetti. The Communist Party provided an effective infrastructure through which everyday experiences took on meanings separate from those channeled through capitalism. The party held open a gap in the given through which people could see themselves in collective struggle changing the world. The American communists speaking in Gornick's book recount their lives in the party in sensorially vivid terms. The intensity of the felt experience that they invoke cuts through everyday deprivation and frustration, making real the possibility of another world, they can already feel it. Working to build it, to bring it about, they remake their individual experiences of capitalist injustice into moments of collective communist equality. Ben Saltzman, a New York garment worker says, I had the party and I had my comrades, and they made me strong, strong on my feet. Joe Prison, a Brooklyn trade unionist, similarly observes, history was all around you. You could touch it, smell it, see it. And when a labor organizer who was also a communist got up to talk you could taste it in your mouth. Bell Rothman, a union organizer, insists. You don't understand. We had no choice. It's not like today, where the kids think they have the choice to be political or not be political, or be any other damn thing they want to be. We had no choice. We did not choose, we were chosen. Life came in on us, and we were bashed over the head, and we struggled to our knees and to our feet, and when we were standing there was the Communist Party. End of quotation by Rothman. 
Sarah Gordon, who grew up communist in the Bronx, explains how political attachment to the Communist Party literally negated our deprivation. It was rich, warm, energetic, an exciting thickness in which our lives were wrapped. It nourished us when nothing else nourished us. It not only kept us alive, it made us powerful inside ourselves. By attending to the effective attachments of communists to their party, I draw out the practical optimism that enabled the egalitarian intensity and desire of the crowd to endure after the crowds dispersed. Infrastructure of Feeling Writing in the 1980s, as Marxism today was reconfiguring British communism for new times, replacing capitalism with Thatcherism as its enemy and communism with progressive modernization as its goal, Raphael Samuel evoked the lost world of British communism. The proximate occasion for Samuel's evocation was the defeat of the miners' strike and the split in the CPGB, variously rendered as an opposition between a hard and a soft left, Stalinists and Eurocommunists fundamentalists and realists, or Morning Star and Marxism today. The more fundamental occasion was the change with which the left had found itself grappling since 1968, the erosion of collectivity amidst ever-increasing political, economic, and societal emphasis on personal identity and individual self-assertion. Collectivity, instead of being the means of realizing the common good, Samuel writes, was coming to be seen as an instrument of coercion promoting uniformity rather than diversity, intimidating the individual, and subordinating the minority to the unthinking mass. In the 70s and 80s, all social institutions, particularly those associated with the welfare state, came under attack from left and right. Yet as Samuel explains, those associated with working-class collectivism were particularly vulnerable, once the decision to strike becomes a matter of personal decision rather than of obedience to collective discipline or of upholding collective honor, it is subject to all those discriminations and cross-currents which make it so difficult to cope with every day. Samuel writes to refresh and retain the memory of collective power. In some ways, Samuel gives us a communism resolutely in step with the one its critics describe, a secular religion woven out of ministry, self-sacrifice, faith, and unity. Here communism is the way, the truth, and the light. Providing an international fellowship, promise of redemption, and the Soviet Union as the promised land, the communism of Samuel's childhood exudes rightness and certitude. At the same time, his communism also appears as familial and pedagogic, less a matter of metaphysical conviction than of everyday life. Samuel's mother and most of her relatives were communists, their communism a bridge by which the children of the ghetto entered the national culture as well as an educational surrogate for university. To be recruited into the party was to enter into a system of education with readings, classes, lectures, and study. In this setting, class consciousness was developed as a political consciousness. Neither an individual identity, sociological given, or even collective self-awareness, class was used in a metaphorical rather than a literal sense. It was an outlook on the world, a way of thinking in terms of laws and tendencies and acting in accordance with political allegiance. Samuel rejects the idea that the Communist Party was ever workerist, seeing the retreat into trade unionism in the 60s and 70s as a displaced expression of the party's disenchantment with itself, a symptom of the accretion of failure, disappointment, and tragedy following Khrushchev's secret speech, the invasion of Hungary, and the Sino-Soviet split. The party lost the will and capacity to make demands on itself. Those industrial workers who remained in the party turned their focus to factory issues and factory workers turned less to the party than to their own immediate struggles. Underpinning these institutional analogies of church, family, and university were the practices through which the party organized its members. Communists were caught up in an endless round of activity that left them very little personal time. Treated as a good in itself. Activity not only enveloped members deeply and daily in political work but also incited a sense of urgency, what they were doing had to be done, it was vital, necessary, urgent. Good communists involved themselves in a wide variety of day-to-day -day struggles. The party held meetings, rallies, and membership drives. It published and distributed a wide array of literature. It organized demonstrations, mobilized strike support, carried out emergency protests. Committed to direct action and immediate struggle, the CPGB planned campaigns, developing systems and processes for making its actions more efficient, for following up and self-assessment. 
it worked to concentrate its resources and energy so that it would seem more powerful than it was. It reviewed tasks, prepared agendas, and drew up committees. Members were more than members. They had practical positions and responsibilities far beyond those given to them by their place in capitalism. They had specialized roles such that each was always more than him or herself. Each was also someone in the party, organizer, bureau member, instructor, trainer, branch officer, propagandist, literature seller, delegate, agitator. Related to this, Samuel says, was a positive mania for reports which served both as an elaborate system of tutelage and as a method of accountability. Reporting installed a practice of looking at activity from the perspective of the party. Samuel describes communist organizational passion in detail, treating it as a series of disciplines of the faithful, efficiency in the use of time, solemnity in the conduct of meetings, rhythm and symmetry in street marches, statistical precision in the preparation of reports. What comes through in his account is the effective register of organization. Organization is not just a matter of bureaucracy and control. It's a generator of enthusiasm, an apparatus of intensification that ruptures the everyday by breaking with spontaneism. Planning is a matter of collective mindfulness. Samuel writes, to be organized was to be the master rather than the creature of events. In one register it signified regularity, in another strength, in yet another control. Organization produced a shared sense of strength, of a collective with the capacity to carry out its will. The party meeting, even at the local and branch level, was conducted with great care. Samuel recounts meetings that his mother's husband, Bill, attended in the early thirties. Ten to fifteen comrades met in the kitchen of a locomotive driver and his wife. The leader was a school teacher. The treasurer was a dock worker who hadn't a political idea in his head but just loved the party. He was very passionate about funds. Bill remembered the meeting as solemn. Members would discuss world events but the primary purpose of the meeting was checking up on decisions, knowing who was going to do what. Later during the war Bill attended meetings of his factory branch in the Three Magpies pub. It wasn't exactly formal, but there was a lot of authority there. It wasn't me. It was in the room. Bill doesn't mean in the pub. But he doesn't mean not in the pub, either. He is pointing to the sensibility the group meeting generated. The meeting authorized those who met, transforming a group of people having a pint in the pub into the Communist Party. Their words and actions took on an importance far beyond what they would have been absent the party. They acquired resonance, transferring the force and importance of global struggle into the three magpies. Samuel sets out the specific elements of a meeting. The comrade who opened the meeting made a report. The one who closed it summed up. Everyone was expected to contribute to discussion, speaking formally by addressing the chair, comrade chairman. Quotation by Samuel The point of a party meeting was to get things done, to translate the events of the day into campaigning issues. The political report which opened a meeting, even a disciplinary hearing began with one, started with the international situation before drawing the lessons and setting out targets and tasks. If the discussion got bogged down in particulars, there would be someone to raise the level of the discussion by reminding us of the seriousness of the situation. End of quotation by Samuel The meeting connected the local, the immediate, with world historical events, think globally, act locally was communist practice long before it became an activist slogan. Unlike the moves to the personal and political that often disrupt political discussions in an individualist age, comrades drew strength from seeing themselves in a larger setting, from recognizing that rather than being unique they were typical, generic. The particular was a bog, a swampy morass that a group could get stuck in and out of which it would have to be pulled. Lessons could then be learned, conclusions drawn and plans made. Meetings broadened lives by opening them to the political, attaching them to movements and tendencies that took them out of miserable isolation. The world didn't simply happen to them. They fought to shape the world. Samuel observes that much party activity was less instrumental than expressive. Organization had a fantastic dimension, buttressing illusions of control, expressing dreams of power and efficacy as capable of being fulfilled. If weakness was a matter of failures of organization, then strength would accrue as these were corrected. To the extent that organization enabled members of the CPGB to imagine their party as shaping the world, 
they could believe in what they were doing whether or not their rallies and daily worker headlines corresponded to any actually significant political influence. But even with this observation, Samuel rightly refuses to allow the cynical, dismissive, and defeatist attitude of a contemporary left that looks at the world from the perspective of capitalism to fill in the gap of possibility British communists were able to maintain. He continues to see from the perspective of the party. The party, shortcomings and all, continues to provide an ego ideal or symbolic point from which to view actions as momentous. The party sustains the perspective it provides such that agitating against imperialism in a colonial society, campaigning against fascism, keeping alive the housing question, and supporting 20 years of hunger marches manifest the heroic work of energetic comrades, communism in the actuality of political movement. Multiple activities were not a differentiated pluralism of possibilities but a singular communist politics, envisioned as and from the perspective of the enduring struggle of the masses. Samuel's account of party activity isn't unique to CPGB. It resonates with the experiences of American communists. Quotation by Gornick For thousands of communists, being a communist meant years of selling the daily worker, running off mimeographed leaflets, speaking on street corners, canvassing door-to-door -door for local and national votes, organizing neighborhood groups for tenants' rights or welfare rights or unemployment benefits, raising money for the party or for legal defenses or bail bonds or union struggles. Only that and nothing more. End of quotation by Gornick what Gornick calls the grinding ordinariness of the life of party members in the U.S., like that in the U.K., involved ceaseless activity. Gornick presents the dream of revolution as external to this activity. I disagree. It wasn't the vision that sustained the activity. The activity was the practical optimism that sustained the vision. Consistent activity, particularly the planning, meetings, and reports, generated the perspective of the party that enabled it. Consistency made it possible for the everyday to feel momentous, for neighborhood matters to become more than their immediacy, to become vehicles transmitting the sense of the world. Organization concentrated collective sentiment into a form other than the deprivations of capital and state, enabling people to see themselves and the world from the perspective of a gap in the given, a gap of hope and possibility. Hosea Hudson's experiences as a black communist in the U.S. South support my reversal of the relation between activity and vision. Hudson describes unit meetings, section meetings, and branch meetings, printing and distributing leaflets, reports, checkups, and criticism, recruiting people one by one. Born in 1898 into a family of Alabama sharecroppers, Hudson worked as a molder at the Stockham Foundry in Birmingham in the 1920s. Even before the Depression hit in full force, workers in the Gray Iron Department faced wage cuts, the result of the stagger system they would work two days one week three the next, and some weeks not at all, that accompanied the introduction of a conveyor and a point system for determining pay. Hudson became aware of the party in 1930 because of their leafleting, the people were always putting them around the community, but I didn't know who they was. They'd drop by at night and you'd pick them up in the morning, there'd be a leaflet on your porch. Hudson couldn't read, so he'd get his wife to read the leaflets for him. Early in 1931, his interest in the party increased because of the Scottsboro case. Nine young African-American men, one was 12 years old, were accused of raping two white women on a freight train. The party led the campaign in their defense. When invited to his first meeting, Hudson was living in a company house, Stool Pigeon Row, that is, a block where all the houses were occupied by company people. Hudson was anxious when Al Murphy, a party member recently fired from the foundry, approached his house in broad daylight with an armful of papers, including the Liberator, which argued for Negro self-determination in the black belt of the U.S. South. And here come this guy Murphy they done fired out the shop. He know he been spotted, they know who he is, he brought me papers, come strutting up the street, everybody know him, ain't nowhere to hide, and he come there, leave me a paper. Hudson had known Murphy briefly when Murphy worked in the foundry's coal room. He knew Murphy was involved with an organization defending the Scottsboro Boys and that he had been in New York. Hudson had asked Murphy about meetings in Birmingham, but Murphy, suspicious, kept mum. And then he comes by Hudson's house, openly, strutting up the street. Anyone can see him, and people know who he is. Murphy's not afraid. 
Hudson says that he himself was never scared of the Reds, although other people were because of the risk of losing their jobs. Hudson wasn't afraid of that either, having been fired multiple times. When he says that Murphy come busting up to my house and yard with an armful of papers in broad daylight, he isn't contrasting Murphy's confidence with his own fear. He associates it instead with the damage that people who are inexperienced in the party can do to someone with a job and living in a company house. Hudson judges Murphy from the party perspective to which Murphy himself introduced him. It's as if Murphy embodies a set of different breaks and possibilities, breaks between employed and unemployed, housed and homeless, open and hidden, literate and illiterate, confident and cautious, developed and inexperienced. That first meeting Hudson attended was in the small house of another worker from the shop. As Hudson tells it, I didn't say anything, but I'm a little let down, cause I'm looking for a big something, important people. And here's the guys working in the shop with me, regular guys. In this disappointing, unimportant setting, a small house with regular guys, Murphy outlines the role and program of the party. Quotation by Murphy the Scottsboro case and the unemployed and the depression and the imperialist war. You had all that he was talking about that night. In the biggest part, I didn't know what he was saying. All I know is about the Scottsboro case. He was explaining about how the Scottsboro case is a part of the whole frame-up of the Negro people in the South, Jim Crow, frame-up, lynching, all that was part of the system. So I could understand that all right, and how speed up, the unemployment, and how the unemployed people wouldn't be able to buy back what they make, that they was consumers and that it would put more people in the street, he took the conveyor, up there where we mold, took that and made a pattern, said, how many men been kicked out in the street after they put that conveyor machine in there. I could see that. End of quotation by Murphy Hudson understands some of what he hears, but not everything, not even the biggest part. Murphy's words evoke something bigger that Hudson hears but doesn't understand even as he gets that this bigger something connects with his life, his concerns. Hudson goes to the meeting expecting a big something which he doesn't quite find for the biggest part remains what he doesn't know. Important people don't occupy that place. Instead, regular guys, like him, are, like him, they're in the small house listening to Murphy and all signing up that night for the party. Hudson doesn't describe arousing inspiring speech. He doesn't say anything about revolution or the mission of the proletariat. Instead, he sees a pattern, a pattern that connects the conveyor in the foundry, unemployment, Jim Crow, and lynching to something bigger. Hudson doesn't say that the party knows what this something is, but he experiences it as the place of this something, this gap of more to and in the world than what he has already known. He mentions looking on Murphy and another comrade, Ted Horton, as kind of special. Unlike people who could only talk about what was happening around Birmingham, Horton and Murphy met different people, people coming through from New York and Chattanooga. They could always talk about a certain meeting over yonder. The same night Hudson joins the party he's elected organizer of the Stockham unit. Murphy tells him that it will be his responsibility to meet on Friday nights with other unit organizers from around Birmingham. Hudson's first unit organizers meeting was much like his first party meeting. I was somewhat surprised, to see such a small group of people, he explains. I was looking for a large group of people. He feels that the party is something big, he expects it to be bigger. The seven people at that first organizers meeting, all black, Hardson doesn't meet a white comrade until the next year, are thrilled finally to have an actual industrial worker in their group. They were all from community units and the party was trying to concentrate on industry, as Hudson would later learn. After he was fired five months later, members of his shop unit were afraid to meet, so he set up neighborhood units, organizing people around unemployment relief. Leafleting was the primary activity of Hudson's unit. The group would leave pamphlets setting out the party program and updating readers on the Scottsboro Boys case on porches, gates, and church steps. The units also held classes where they would read and discuss articles from the Liberator. We would read this paper and this would give us great courage. We'd compare, we'd talk about the right of self-determination. We discussed the question of if we established a government, what role we comrades would play, then about the relationship of the white, of the poor white, of the farmers, etc. in this area. In Depression-era Alabama, 
The space of the party enabled Hudson and his comrades to see themselves as possessing constituent power, to imagine themselves as establishing a government, setting out the principles and processes for a new, liberated, majority black society. Hudson couldn't read, but he had a practical optimism sufficient for imagining himself making a new world as he engaged in the struggles of the day, the right to vote, against lynching, police brutality, the right for poor rural Negroes to sell their products, that was immediate. Hudson had this practical optimism because of his work in the party. In one of these meetings on a hot July night Hudson first learned about democratic rights. Someone asked a white comrade from New York whether Negroes would ever enjoy democratic rights under the current system. Hudson stops him, saying I don't know what you mean by democratic rights. I hear you all talking about democratic, what is democratic rights? The white comrade, Hudson says, didn't get mad, say you ought to know, or stuff like that. He stopped and explained it in detail. In the party, Hudson learned to read and write well enough to publish a book. He attended the party's national training school. The party reinforced his confidence, strengthening his courage. Quotation by Hudson What the party was doing was taking this lower class like myself and making people out of them, took the time and they didn't laugh at you if you made a mistake. In other words, it made this lower class feel at home when they sit down in a meeting. If he got up and tried to talk and he couldn't express himself, nobody liable to laugh at him. They tried to help him and tell them, you'll learn. There was always something to bring you forward, to give you courage, the party made me know that I was somebody. End of quotation by Hudson Before he joined the party, Hudson sang with a quartet and attended church. So he had already a kind of confidence, but not the kind that would let him speak easily with the better class blacks or with whites. In part Hudson's insecurity was a matter of his illiteracy. The little primary education he had as a child was traumatizing. To get to school, he had to walk several miles alone through woods and pastures and he was afraid of encountering a snake or mad dog. Once he got to school he chewed his sleeves with nervousness. His grandmother instructed the teacher to whip him till he stopped. As soon as he was big enough, he was pulled from school for spring plowing even as his younger brother was allowed to continue to study. The favored younger brother became a preacher. Until he joined the party, Hudson was held down in inferiorities that tied him to a world of poverty and violence. The party brought him up out of it, not just by helping him acquire skills but by imbuing him with collective strength. He came to know he was somebody by experiencing the way the party made people out of the lower class. Even meetings, perhaps especially meetings, helped instill this sensibility as they made them feel at home. As comrades in the Communist Party, they could see and feel the power their collectivity gave them, the strength that comes from solidarity. Comrades wouldn't laugh at someone having trouble expressing himself. They would support him as one of their own and in that support give him the sense of a world where equality was possible, even when it wasn't easy. Collective Desire Mid-century British and US American communists experienced the political life structured by the party as intensely demanding and alive. Its language, meetings, rituals, and reports channeled poverty and hope into practical optimism. The party perspective made their actions significant, nothing less than the historical struggle of the world's oppressed. Isolated deprivation became collective power, rupturing capitalism's own incessant drumbeat of inferiority and failure. No one had to go it alone, to experience politics as either out of reach or inchoate longing. The party provided an effective structure that didn't allow people to give in to their shallower desires and, in so doing, brought out the best in them. This disallowance was a constraint sometimes experienced as punishing, always felt as a requirement or compulsion, that which must be done. Sarah Gordon describes how she hated selling the daily worker during her twenty years in the party. But I did it, I did it. I did it because if I didn't do it, I couldn't face my comrades the next day. And we all did it for the same reason, we were accountable to each other. It was each other we'd be betraying if we didn't push down the gagging and go do it. You know, people never understand that. They say to us, the Communist Party held a whip over you. They don't understand. The whip was inside each of us, we held it over ourselves, not each other. Party names a common interior force. Gordon couldn't help but resist it. 
its demands went up against her natural inclinations as if shoved down her throat. Her opposition was visceral. Yet the interiorized structure of comradeship would win out. A collective desire for collectivity was stronger than her individual wants. Feeling its strength inside her, she felt the power of the party. The sense of what she must do was the same as the sense of what the party could do. Hudson recounts how recruiting people into the party requires patience, nuance, and judgment. Recruiting wasn't just grabbing or pushing. It had to be taught. We were teaching our comrades all the way down through the units. We'd teach how to approach people, how to recruit. In the early 30s, the party was concentrating on industrial workers, which meant contacting individual people, making it a regular responsibility. Steel workers, railroad porters, school teachers, and chauffeurs were all different and had to be approached differently. Hudson evokes the difference by contrasting the feeling of facing that hot steel every morning with being someone who got a party somewhere they're going to tonight. Teachers and insurance writers are workers, but they line all different altogether, big time, big parties, having big outings somewhere. They ain't got time to talk about working class oppression. Industrial workers have time to talk about it because they face it every day. Yet these workers, even though they know all about the mine, all about the plant, when they come out, they don't have nothing to say. One group of workers can talk but they don't have time. The other has the time because they have to have the time. But they don't express themselves. Hudson makes the party into an instrument for the workers' self-expression, a vehicle for getting that feeling in the mind that they all know up out of the mine and connecting it with the world. Without the party, working-class oppression would remain underground, unexpressed. Hudson presents the party's workers like that of a nursing mother, industrial workers are the main baby. You got to nurse that baby, but you ain't going to let the baby over here go hungry because you are trying to nurse this one. He presents the party's workers like that of a farmer, you sow the seed. And he presents it as a moral imperative, compelling because of the way it comes in to take the feeling that workers face every morning in the mine and turn it into something else, a source of strength that the workers feel collectively in themselves. Hudson describes writing leaflets with the industrial workers, his steel plant section published a monthly bulletin, The Hot Blast, you tell what's going on, tell how it's happening, but let the workers help to write it. Don't you write it. Involve them all the way through. Make them believe that they somebody. In other words, make them feel that they're doing it, and not you doing it for them. Practices of reporting and checking amplify the sense of being somebody as they make each accountable to the group. One was somebody because one mattered to the collective. These practices were key to the leafleting system. Hudson's network could cover all of Birmingham in half an hour. He describes a checkup meeting in 1933. Some in the section had talked to people in the community where a John Gordon was supposed to have distributed leaflets. The people hadn't seen any. At the checkup meeting, members made reports about their leafleting. John Gordon talked all about where he put his leaflets, what people had said about them, how they were reading them and then giving them to neighbors. Hudson says to Gordon, I went through there, and I found ain't nobody know anything about those leaflets. I asked three or four people, nobody ain't seen the leaflets. At this point, Gordon gives in. As Hudson tells it, you see guys go to sweating then, cause the questions getting too sharp. Gordon began to scratch and wiggle in his chair. Other comrades pressure him with questions, where did he actually put the leaflets? It turns out, he put them down a sewer manhole in the street. And then we all showed him just how he was helping the bosses against the interest of the oppressed Negro and poor white workers who could not get sufficient food to eat and clothing to keep themselves and their children warm from the cold winter weather. John Gordon muttered, No one was going to do his work for him, just like no one but the communists was seeing after the oppressed Negro and poor white workers. Those ten leaflets down the sewer were ten leaflets that poor Negroes did not get to read, ten missed opportunities for understanding why their children were hungry and how they could do something about it. The opportunities were now lost and exerted the force of their unrealization on the comrades. To be somebody was to be accountable and to be accountable was to feel the moral pressure of the collective. The party expected members to do what they said they were going to do. It turns out John Gordon had been talking a lot with the Birmingham police. He was kicked out of the party. The party made Hudson feel like somebody. As a party organizer he sought to let others feel like somebody, which meant seeing themselves from the perspective of the party. The feeling of mattering is a political consciousness, the practical optimism that accompanies an understanding of how things work.
the patterns that connect new machinery and the plant with lynching and imperialism. Knowing how things get done flows into a sense of what it takes to get things done, planning, organization, and solidarity, which feeds back in on and is reinforced in the effective space of the party. The effective intensity of the party works on its members, making them stronger together than they were apart as it pushes them to act in collective rather than individual interest. Each feels the inner force of their collective strength as a command or duty. This duty is the collective desire impressing itself in the individual comrade. To the extent that the individual is a comrade, is a communist, doing his or her duty isn't a seeding of desire, it's fidelity to it. Betraying the party is giving way on desire, and the only thing, La Khan would say, of which one can be guilty. Hudson's wife, Sophie, didn't support his party work. By she not being politically developed, not being developed along with me, it just pulled us apart. Hudson learns in the 70s that while he was busy organizing back in the 30s, going to meetings and traveling, Sophie was having sex with another man. That's some of the results of the things I had to pay for and sacrifice for, trying to carry out this one thing that was my duty as a party person. The party was a political party, and only the most developed, the most developed and class conscious, the people who's willing to sacrifice, to take the sacrifice, to make the sacrifice and would be willing to accept the discipline of the party could be members of the party. Hudson did not have to be a member of the Communist Party. In fact, he couldn't even just choose to be a member. He had to be chosen. Not just anyone was invited to join. Being chosen meant that he was somebody and the sacrifices he made for the party confirmed that the party was right in its choice. He was, in fact, somebody. He was somebody because of his identification with the ego ideal of the party. From the perspective of the party he could see himself as doing things that were important. Samuel, in his account of British communism in the 40s and 50s, is not wrong to imply that the CP embodied a secular Calvinism whereby comrades sought to justify their election. The willingness to make sacrifices, whether in terms of time, comfort, or money, also seems to have been a litmus test of dedication lower down the party scale, as in some of the party's successor organizations of more recent times, there was a relentless pressure on members to be active. The pressure was the interior force of their own collectivity. They exerted it on themselves. Every sacrifice strengthened it, generating a sense of the more that needed to be done and that could be done if more sacrifices were made. To be politically developed, as Hudson would say, was to feel a gap open up in the world between the actual and the possible and to see the world from the perspective of that gap. Samuel reads a CPGB appeal from 1945 as masochistic in its evocation of specific instances of heroic self-sacrifice, the heads on the blocks and nooses around the neck, the starvation, imprisonment, and deprivation endured with steadfast hope. I take masochistic to signal not self-punishment or self-inflicted pain but the reflexivity of collective desire as it works backs upon itself. The party takes the perspective that the situation of the oppressed and exploited is not necessary. It can be changed, redressed, abolished. To the extent that exploitation continues, enough is not being done to stop it. The party is the collective that makes the force of this realization into its maxim. There is always an answer to Lenin's question what is to be done. And that answer is always too much. Too much is to be done and that excess is the force the party turns on itself. The enthusiasm and solidarity that infuses the party's commitment to ongoing political action works back on the comrades as an intensity that relentlessly pushes them from within themselves. Peggy Dennis, a journalist and organizer for CPUSA, her husband served as general secretary and went to prison under the Smith Act during the McCarthy era, expresses the interior pull of the party. Dennis was the daughter of Russian Jewish revolutionaries who immigrated to California shortly before the 1905 revolution. Her mother was disappointed when Dennis got pregnant and married. She had taught her daughter that personal love was not a sufficient singular purpose in life, that for women, no less than for men, there must be much more to an enriched life. Conventional marriage was the deadly trap and motherhood was the snaplock to that trap door. In 1929, when Dennis's child was first born, her husband was in jail. He had been arrested during a street meeting in front of the Marine Workers Union Hall. The unpermitted street meeting, a tumultuous assembly, came about because the hall for a planned protest was denied at the last minute. The protest was around the Red Camp case. The Young Communist League's children's summer camp had been raided by a posse of American legionnaires led by local sheriffs. The children were moved to juvenile court. 
The adults were charged with conspiracy to teach the tenets of communism. The raid on the camp and subsequent arrest of communists and militants was part of an ongoing struggle in Los Angeles as employers and government viewed demands for jobs or relief and bread or wages as the harbinger of social revolution. Quotation by Dennis Meanwhile, I was chafing, restlessly. I nursed our infant, scrubbed his diapers and carefully observed the rigid schedules prescribed in those days by government pamphlets on infant training. But no great surge of mother love enveloped me. Mama adored the baby, but carefully left me in sole charge. Gene came home from his meetings or jail absences to stand gazing at his sleeping son. Only I was an unfeeling monster, except in the silence of the 2 a.m. feeding. With the child pulling at my breast and the exciting world outside stilled the small body in my arms and I did communicate. But with the morning came the beat of struggle that passed me by. End of quotation by Dennis Dennis feels the party as the beat of struggle, the pull of solidarity, a longing for the density and equality that comes through collective action. Self-critically she observes her own chafing against the reduction of her world around an infant's demands even as she links these demands to a rigid, coercive government. She judges herself as monstrous for longing for the excitement of the external world. The struggle that matters is outside, the fight to feed, clothe, or house the millions thrown on the scrap heap of capitalism. Confined by the deadly trap of motherhood, Dennis is pulled in different directions by an interior crowd. She writes that she was under strict orders from everyone not to get arrested. Everyone included her mother, husband, the Young Communist League, and the party. A crowd was enjoining her to focus on the baby. She was a nursing mother and had to attend to the newborn. Dennis explains, not getting arrested meant staying out of street actions or public meetings. I taught classes, wrote leaflets, served on committees that planned actions for others who would get arrested. I felt guilty. As if feeling the avoidance of arrest as a manifestation of what Canetti calls the traitor within, she judges herself for betraying her comrades, for a failure of courage and solidarity. Dennis subjectivizes an impossibility, turning the barrier to action into an internal barrier, a personal failing. The perspective from which she judges is the perspective of the party, even when her comrades have told her to stay home and she is still tirelessly doing the work of the party. The excess that is the party perspective, the point from which she sees, is the too muchness that both gives party life its intensity and that works back upon the comrades as a superegoic injunction they cannot but give themselves. The gap between possible and enjoined is the gap of communist desire. The party sustains that gap. A 20-year member of CPUSA observes. Quotation by Diana Johnson None of us considered the work we did on the outside important. Because, after all, we knew it didn't matter what you did out there. You were living in a bourgeois capitalist world where everything was shit, everything fed a single purpose, so what did it matter what you did? Your real life was with the party, with your comrades, with things you did in meetings and demonstrations. End of quotation by Diana Johnson all the multiple multitudinous activities of living that seem so necessary from the perspective of capitalism fall to the wayside from the perspective of the party. They don't matter. The party ruptures the bourgeois world of profit and loss so that another one can appear. No wonder Dennis felt guilty, she had ceded the desire for communism that made life worth living. The Actuality of the Communist Party Describing the Communist Party as an awesome structure for concentrating and harnessing in court political emotion, Vivian Gornick employs a metaphor Canetti associates with the crowd, a tidal wave. The tidal wave evokes a sweeping force that cannot be contained or channeled. It exceeds all barriers, engulfing everything it encounters. Like the crowd, the tidal wave is natural and unpredictable, indivisible and unchosen, more a dynamic than a structure or thing. The Communist Party derives its energy from the crowd as it strives to find ways to let the crowd endure, to enable its intensity to be felt even after the crowd has dispersed. It provides a transferential object that can stand in for the crowd, not representing it but pushing the urges it activates in the direction of equality and justice. 
With meetings and actions, the party produces assemblies of intensity that press comrades into action, involving them in practices and activities through which they are accountable to one another. Another assembly of intensity, one the 20th century Communist Party shares with other political forms such as the liberal legal and the religious state, is the trial. Richard Wright provides a compelling account of the Chicago Party trial of Ross, one of his comrades in the mid 1930s. On a cold Sunday afternoon, a small group of Chicago communists concentrates the oppression and suffering of the masses of the world into a South Side meeting hall. As they speak, they flood the hall with the needs and struggles of millions upon millions, a sea of workers, a field of peasants, mountains of the unemployed. They transfer a complex array of anger, failure, and longing one to another, building and reinforcing an awareness of what can be done out of what must be done. At its start, the trial is informal, like a conversation among neighbors over a common problem. Anyone can speak. Underneath the informality, a deeper structure unfolds. Speakers describe the world situation, presenting facts about the rise of fascism and the Soviet Union's struggle to survive as the world's lone workers' state. The logic of this structure is to provide the correct perspective from which to consider Ross's actions. The perspective is like a law, the law enabling communist desire setting it apart from the capitalist world by holding up and uniting the experiences of the oppressed. It's a law communists give themselves in order to hold themselves together when everything conspires to pull them apart, police repression, fear and paranoia, individual desire and need. In instances where solidarity is at risk of fraying, a standard of common judgment on matters of common concern is necessary. That standard can only come from the struggles of the exploited masses themselves. Over the course of several hours, party speakers produce a vivid picture of mankind under oppression. Once world conditions are clear, different speakers talk about the poverty and suffering on Chicago's South Side, specifically, its Negro population and the tasks of the Communist Party. They thereby fuse the world, the national and the local into one overwhelming drama of moral struggle. Everyone in the hall participates in it. No one escapes. All are implicated. In the intensity of the trial, the comrades voices and thrown a new sense of reality in the hearts of those present, a sense of man on earth. With the exception of the church and its myths and legends, there was no agency in the world so capable of making men feel the earth and the people upon it as the communist party. For those in the hall, the world is not what it was. Reality itself has been ruptured, impressed upon by the weight of the many. Wright had not wanted to attend the trial and in attending he had vowed not to participate. Yet the passional dynamics the trial sets free sweep over everyone, Wright included. The impossible demands of the many, for which the party serves as a transferential object, cannot not be betrayed. Confrontation with this guilt unleashes immense, unbearable anxiety. The force of the uncounted many envelopes the hall, becoming more and more, a gigantic tension relentless in its commanding need. Turned in on a single person, it is crushing not in the sense of the density and equality accompanying the discharge but as a more fundamental exclusion that cuts a person off from political subjectivity altogether. Wright says that the charges against Ross aren't brought until well into the evening. Those that bring them are not central committee members or high-level operatives. They're Ross's own friends. When it comes time for Ross to defend himself, he wilts, trembling and unable to talk. He calls no one to speak in his behalf. The hall was as still as death. Guilt was written in every pore of his black skin, his personality, his sense of himself, had been obliterated. Yet he could not have been so humbled unless he had shared and accepted the vision that had crushed him, the common vision that bound us all together. Ross is guilty because his desire is so great, so magnified and intense, that it cannot not be betrayed. The superegoic force of the party concentrates collective desire into an impossible, unshakable desire for collectivity. Ross confesses. He accepts his guilt, recounts his errors, outlines plans to reform. Wright makes it clear that Ross had not been duped, he had been awakened. It was not a fear of the Communist Party that had made him confess, but a fear of the punishment that he would exact of himself that made him tell of his wrongdoings. The Communists had talked to him until they had given him new eyes with which to see his own crime, he was one with all the members there, regardless of race or color, his heart was theirs and their hearts were his. And when a man reaches that state of kinship with others, the degree of oneness, or when a trial has made him kin after he has been sundered from them by wrongdoing, then he must rise and say, out of a sense of the deepest morality in the world, 
I'm guilty. Forgive me. A ritual assembly for sundering becomes an intense experience of belonging. Even as it concentrates the enormity of global struggle and oppression, the party provides a structure for relief from that pressure. It gives meaning to suffering. It supplies a vehicle for its redress. Something can be done, but it can only be done together. To insist on one's own way is to do nothing at all because against all of capitalism individual efforts are worthless. In fact, it's even worse, to insist on one's own way is to support capitalism, racism, imperialism, and fascism, to join them in their war against the people. Alone, Ross would be left isolated in his confrontation with the impossible demands of the people. With his comrades, he could experience the power of these demands in forcing change. As Wright depicts it, Ross's trial has echoes of Socrates' trial before the Athenians. Charges are brought by friends. The accused does not call on anyone to speak in his behalf. The real trial is before history, who is actually guilty here? The Athenians? The party? The difference is that unlike Plato, Wright expresses the ambivalence of collective power. The Chicago comrades were wrong, living blind and limited lives truncated and impoverished by the oppression they had suffered long before they had ever heard of communism. But a truth appears even through their corrupted consciousness. The experience of equality across race division, the discharge Canetti associates with the crowd, cuts through the spectacle of misguided banishment. Seeing with the party, viewing himself from the same perspective as his accusers, Ross is no Socrates. Where Plato isolates the moral perspective in the figure of Socrates and judges the Athenians from that vantage point, Wright maintains fidelity to the perspective opened by the party even as it hers, even as it fails to apply this perspective to itself. Ross wouldn't be going to jail, of course. The party is a voluntary organization. But the choice goes in both directions, the party that identifies those made out of special stuff also determines who is lacking. It can cut people out cut them off from the epic struggle of the oppressed, push them out of the crowd and into isolation and anxiety. With language surprisingly evocative of Lacan, Wright confesses that he couldn't escape the feeling that Ross enjoyed the trial. For him, this was perhaps the highlight of an otherwise bleak existence. The trial focused the immense effective apparatus of the party onto Ross. The enthusiasm and commitment of millions was activated because of him, or at least in those moments he could feel as if it was, he could feel that his actions and choices were of world historical significance. The feeling couldn't endure. He was to be expelled, after all. But at that moment he was conjoined with the world like no other. Wright describes the trial he witnesses as a spectacle of glory and horror. The ugliness of the party is the other side of its service as a transferential object, its capacity to make the crowd felt after its dissipation. An engulfing crowd may be frightening. The release from the limits of the everyday may be too much. An apparatus for mobilizing emotional longing and generating effective attachment in the service of struggle, the party wields power by exerting the force of the collective on its members. It wields this within the members themselves, as their own collective desire for collectivity. How else would the party maintain a gap within its capitalist setting? Glory and horror are the same arrangement of intensity from two perspectives, the profound feeling of collective strength and the fear such strength can generate. Wright invokes the words of the Internationale, Arise, you prisoners of salvation. The trial exposes the gap of desire as perhaps no other element of party infrastructure can. Desire is never desire for a specific obtainable object, desire cannot be satisfied. Lacan's famous dictum is that desire is the desire of the other. Desire opens up as a gap in the other, as what the other lacks. At times desire can become so overwhelming that it becomes concentrated in a singular place, such as a person imagined as a unified individual. The gap is filled in, the dream of justice truncated and distorted. Misdirected, thwarted back in on itself, desire becomes obscene. It pushes beyond need, beyond demand, into the destructive insistence of the drive. The desire for justice turns in on itself in the enjoyment of power. The actuality of the Communist Party exceeds its errors and betrayals. It encompasses the hopes for justice and aspirations for equality invested in it. To reduce the party to its successes fails to recognize its indispensable capacity to generate practical optimism and collective strength. Such a reduction likewise reduces the world, contracting possibility into what can be done instead of forcing the impossibility of what must be done. The Communist Party enlarged the world. 
expanding the crowd's egalitarian discharge so that it can endure as the emancipatory push of the people, the party increases the crowd's effects. It gives the crowd its meaning and takes this meaning as its own. The party continues the moment of belonging, intensifying and expanding it in solidary purpose. For Justice Thunder's Condemnation How do and can we imagine political change under the conditions of communicative capitalism? Is political change just aggregated personal transformation, communism as viral outbreak or meme effect, hashtag full communism? Do we think that autonomous zones of freedom and equality will emerge like so many mushrooms out of the dregs left behind in capital flight and the shrinking of state social provisioning? Or do we optimistically look to democracy, expecting, all evidence to the contrary, that communism, or even upgraded social democracy, will arise out of electoral politics? All these fantasies imagine that political change can come about without political struggle. Each pushes away the fact of antagonism, division, and class struggle as if late neoliberalism were not already characterized by extreme inequality, violence, and exploitation as if the ruling class did not already use military force, police force, legal force, and illegal force to maintain its position. Politics is a struggle over power. Capital uses every resource, state, non-state, interstate, to advance its position. A left that refuses to organize itself in recognition of this fact will never be able to combat it. In communicative capitalism, individual acts of resistance, subversion, cultural production, and opinion expression, no matter how courageous, are easily absorbed into the circulatory content of global personal media networks. Alone, they don't amplify, they can't endure. They are easily forgotten as new content rushes into and through our feeds. We indulge in fantasies of the freedom of our expression, our critical edge and wit, disavowing the way such individuated freedom is the form of collective incapacity. Against states and alliances wielded in the service of capital as a class, Diverse and separate struggles are so many isolated resistances, refusals to undertake the political work of pulling together an organized, strategic, long-term struggle. The constant churn of demands on our awareness disperses our efforts and attention. What the left should be doing is coordinating, consolidating, and linking its efforts so that they can amplify each other. We don't need multiple, different campaigns. We need an organized struggle against capitalism capable of operating along multiple issues in diverse locations. Crowds push back. From the perspective of the party, we see them as the insistent people. Fidelity to the insistence of the egalitarian discharge demands that we build the infrastructure capable of maintaining the gap of their desire. The more powerful the effective infrastructure we create, the more we will feel its force interiorizing the perspective of the many into the ego ideal that affirms our practices and activities and pushes us to do more than we think we can. Radical pluralists and participatory Democrats sometimes imply that there can be a left politics without judgment, condemnation, exclusion, and discipline. Denying the way that collective power works back on those who generate it, they suggest we can have the benefits of collectivity without its effects. But working back is an inextricable dimension of collectivity's capacity to cut through the self-interest of individual needs and produce enduring bonds of solidarity. Collective activities always have effects in excess of their immediate goals. Rather than fearing these effects, rather than remaining stuck in the fantasy that an individual can change the world, and rather than remaining so gripped by fears of power that we fantasize a politics that can abolish it, we should confront the force of collectivity directly and take responsibility for generating it and using it. The party capable of building an effective infrastructure that can cut through the barriers of capitalist expectation will err. Uh, it is not, cannot be, and should not be believed to be infallible. Sometimes it may turn its immense energies on itself. If we can't bear it, we aren't the left, the communists, we need. Anyone who is unwilling to talk about the party should not talk about political transformation.